They not only are restoring, uh, still restoring homes and businesses. Uh, recently, there's a there is a um, church that they finally finished up, and uh, they were able to start having church on Sunday. And it's in a, it's the only church left in this. What they call? I'm looking around. Pe- what? Uh, Ward, the lower ninth ward, or something like that. There's like one. There's one grocery store. There is no um, um, uh, gas station, and now there's one church. And we're talking about a place where there were thousands of people that lived. And so, the thing too is, when we were down there, um, not only were we working on stuff, but there were people doing prayer walks and praying for people and. And so they, they do that as well as helping when there's an emergency. There was floods in Louisiana not too long ago. They went and uh, helped restore those. That anywhere there's something in the United States like, like that, um, was it Sandy or what, whatever it was on the East Coast. Am I thinking right? Y'all are looking at me like I'm speaking. In, no, no not, not Katrina, but I mean, yeah. Anyway. So it's a great thing, and, and the Lord has raised her up. You know, the Lord keeps promoting her. She has more and more responsibility now. She's doing ministry not only down there, but all over the world. She went to Thailand not too long ago, uh, led a prophetic ministry over there. She's going to be doing uh, the same this year in different places. So, And she's one of our own. So we're going to take an offering up, and whatever the Lord puts it on, on your heart to do, uh, do it joyfully, right? The Lord says He loves a cheerful, hilarious giver, right? Turn to somebody and say, it's time to get happy. <laughs> All right. So, Father, we, we thank You for Carrie and the ministry, Lord, and we just thank You that we get a chance to partner with her and, Lord, to help her fulfill the call on her life uh, in meeting the needs of so many people. And, Lord, we just bless her in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. And now it's the man of the hour. <laughs> Everybody, give Richard a hand. Louder, louder. Don't stop. Don't stop. <laughs> hey, here's my offering. Pass me. Tanner, 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 Tanner. It's good that one of our own leaves this place and goes out and does ministry. That's what the church is to do, is to bring up, to build up, to edify, and send out. You know, so many churches today say, stay here. Nothing happens without somebody's blessing, and it stays right here. It's not about right here. It's about out there. Amen? Amen? Thank you. I'll preach this side over here. Last week, last Sunday, I taught on death. What is death? The definition of death, the biblical definition of death. And we saw in there that death is separation. Physical death is when the soul, the soul, the spirit leaves the body. We saw that there can be uh, a death of purpose. That if I have a purpose, if I had a bowl up here and I dropped it and broke it, I have destroyed it. It is death due to it does no longer serves its purpose. We see that there was uh, a spiritual death. We saw how Adam was kicked out of the garden. He said, the day you eat of this tree, you're going to die. They ate of the tree, but they didn't fall over dead. Death started in them, and they later died 930 years later. But the thing is, they were kicked out of the presence of God. Spiritual separation from God was death. So we see that there's very, the, what I call the, the multiple faces of death. But what I want to talk to you about today is life. We, saw, we talked about death. I want to talk about life. And uh, I want to open with the, the scripture in 1 John 5.11. It says, and this is the record that God hath given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He that hath the Son hath life. 
He that has not the Son has not life. So, Father, I thank you and I praise you. I thank you for the journey that you've taken me on and in looking at some of this. Father, I just ask that you just touch me, that your anointing will be upon me to deliver this message, that your people will be edified, they will be built up, encouraged. Give us ears to hear and hearts to understand, Father, and eyes to see where we are and where we're going and who you are and who we are in Christ Jesus. We give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Everyone said, Amen. 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 Is everybody doing okay today? Are we happy? Good. I'm getting ready to change that. We talked about physical death. We talked about spiritual death, personal death. I want to read something to you in Genesis. I've got a long way to go, and I didn't make a PowerPoint today because I don't know exactly which way I'm going to go with this. There's a lot to it, so I'm just going to I'm just going to see where the Holy Spirit takes us. Amen. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, and that it was good. Now, we've talked about this before. We're going to talk about it again. God saw the light and saw that it was good. That word good in Hebrew is tov, T-O-V-E. And it means that it is completed for a particular work, and it's where it's supposed to be doing what it's supposed to be doing. And he said, that's good. He saw the light, and it was good. And then he turns around and says, and he separated the light from the darkness. That's interesting. He creates light, but it's mingled with darkness. And he separates it. We're going to get back to that here in just a second. The second day, he does his work, and he says, it is good. The third day, he does his thing, and he says, it is good. The fourth day, it is good. The fifth day, it is good. But they were not very good. And on the sixth day, he creates the beast of the field, and he creates man. I want you to understand what he did. In fact, some of the songs we sang today echoed that. He took a dirt clod. Literally, he took a dirt clod right here in front of him, and he formed it and shaped it into his own image. And he says, and he breathed the breath of life into it, and it became a living soul, and we have Adam. Light was created by a spoken word. Boom, and it was. The earth was created by a spoken word. Boom, and it was. Man, he got down and physically formed this himself. Shaped it, molded it, made it in his image, and then it says he breathed the breath of life into it. We sang that song a while ago, I breathe you in. And that's exactly what happened. And Adam became a living soul. During this time, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Yeah, I'm going to. During this time, Adam names all the animals. All the animals come by and he names them and names them and names them and names them. Male and female and Adam happy. Okay, rabbit trail. Science would have you believe that we evolved from cavemen, which came from monkeys, which came from some crawly fish that came from an amoeba in some slimy pond somewhere and was struck by lightning or however they reasoned it out. And they 
would have you believe that Adam is more like a caveman. <laughs> Hit the woman on the head, drag her in a cave somewhere, and, and that's how life began. And we evolved to who we are today. Well, it's just the opposite. Science says that we use 10% of our brain today. Only 10%. Ray's not here. He only uses 2%. <laughs> Don't tell him I said that. I believe when Adam was created, he used 100% of his brain. Adam's intelligence was off the scale. He named all the animals. He knew what he was doing. He, was, he didn't, wasn't born a baby. God gave him age, and he had the ability to communicate. He had language. This is a sign of highly developed intelligence. And I believe Adam was maybe one of the smartest people that ever lived. I don't know. Can't prove that. But understand, it was after the fall that we started declining, not evolving. So I want you to know, Adam, being as smart as he was, naming all the animals, he saw there were male and there were female but he was alone. God said then, you know, it's not good for man to be alone. You know, the thing is, he wasn't alone. He was with God. Hello? I would think that would be all you need. But God said, he needs a helpmate. He needs somebody else. Put Adam to sleep. Notice Adam had nothing to do with it. Took a rib out. Woman was created. And he said, go multiply, replenish the earth. And that's important. I want you to understand that, how important that is. Because I'm going to come back to that, too. I'm going to show you something very interesting, I think. But now then, we have this six days of creation. One through five, God said it's good. But on day six, if you read in there, Verse 31, it says, God looked at everything he did in the six days, and it was very good. Tov miod. Why was it very good? Because now life can be sustained and reproduced. I want you to understand, day two had to completely rely on day one doing its job. Day four had to completely rely that day one, two, and three did exactly what they were supposed to do. I submit to you today that creation outside our door right now, the trees, the grass, the flowers, birds, the bees, they follow God's law perfectly. Because if they didn't, we couldn't be here. We're totally dependent upon every one of those days doing exactly what God established it and designed it to do. The only creation on the planet that has the ability not to do what God has called us to do is man. Life exists on this planet because all of nature follows God's command. They have no choice. Apples produce apples. Dandelions produce dandelions. Bees produce bees. And like I said last week, monkeys do not produce humans. They produce monkeys. And everything produces after its own kind. And if that law ever gets broken, all chaos is going to break loose in nature, and there can't be life. So I want you to see days one through six all rely on the day before it to do exactly what it's supposed to do. Now we talked about death, about death in purpose. If I had a bowl up here and the bowl was to mix stuff up, but I dropped the bowl and broke it, the rabbis would say, I have destroyed it. 
because it no longer serves its purpose. When Moses came down off of Mount Sinai, not only did he bring Ten Commandments with him, but he had the blueprints to a tabernacle. When he made that tabernacle, and he made it exactly the way God said, it wasn't, well, we'll just, we'll just cut and cover and put it together and piecemeal it, and if it works, it works. If we don't, we'll take it down and redo it. He did it exactly like God instructed. He said, here's the way you do it, and he, and he followed that to the letter. Once it was done, they stood back and looked at it. It was perfect. It was the gold and the silver and the brass and all the co- Everything was perfect. You know what they had? A pretty tent. That was it. It wasn't until the presence of God came in it that it fulfilled its function to house the presence of the Lord. Without the presence of God, that tabernacle was just a pretty tent. But when the presence of God was there, that's where the life began. That's where it fulfilled its purpose. It was alive. If it didn't fulfill its purpose, it would have been dead. It would have been separated from its purpose, and it would have been dead. Let me ask you something. Do you have a purpose? Does man have a purpose? Yes, we do have a purpose. We have a purpose. You remember me talking a while ago, and I said, talked about Adam being very smart. Genius, off the scale genius. Genius times 10. And they were given instructions not to eat of that dumb fruit, whatever it was, of the knowledge of good and evil. Can it? You can have everything else. Everything was theirs. The whole garden was theirs. They could do anything they wanted to, there was no restriction. Except, don't eat of that dumb fruit. Whatever it is, I'm going to call it a dumb fruit. In comes a serpent. And the Bible says, I think it's in First Peter. If it's not there, it's somewhere else. And it says that the woman, Eve, was deceived. She was deceived by what Satan did. It says, but Adam was not. Adam knew exactly what he was doing. Here again, I think that genius level is here. He saw this. Now, I'm going to pose something to you. I'm not trying to come up with a new theology or new doctrine, nothing like that. But I want you to think about this. Adam in the garden, there is no other woman. It's Eve. She was made perfect for him. He was in love with this woman. It's not like, well, she's gone and done something stupid, but I'm going to go marry this horse over here, you know. That's not like that. He was in love. He wanted that one. He wanted Eve more than anything in that garden. And when he saw her eat that fruit, I think he knew exactly where she was headed. Maybe even he saw the glory of God leave her. Because remember we talked about how in the spirit world our eyesight is a whole lot better. We see more than we do through these physical eyes. And I think his eyes were opened spiritually. And I think he could see that glory, that that light that was about her, that she was clothed in innocence. Maybe even a beauty that we can't even understand here. But I believe that when she ate of that fruit, he turned and he saw the woman that he loved. The only woman that he could love. And he said, if she's going to go, I'm going to go with her. And he went and ate the fruit willingly. Why do I say that? Because in the New Testament, we see Jesus, the second Adam, who sees his bride that he loves with all of his heart. The fallen state 
that his bride is in. The miserable condition that we ended up in because of sin. Doing things our way. And Jesus looks at his bride and says, I love her. And so he gives up everything that he was in heaven, whatever that is, became a man. It had to be a man because Adam was a man and brought sin into the world. The second Adam had to be a man also. And he came to this earth, giving up everything so that he could die in the place of his bride so that they could be together. I want you to understand how sacred and holy and important marriage is. That unity between a man and a woman is one of the highest priorities on God's ladder. Because he sent his son to die for a bride. Something else I want you to see. I want you to get this picture. That when Adam's laying on the ground, takes that rib out and makes woman. Probably the same way he made man. Out of the rib though, not the dirt. Out of Adam. And it says, and Adam when he woke, it says that God presented Adam, his bride. Just like in our marriage, the husband, you know, the father walks the bride down the aisle and turns around and gives the bride away to the son. And that's what we see in this garden. He brings a bride out. And Adam, when he saw the condition that Eve was in, he said, I'm going to go with her. I've got to go. I'm not separating. I'm not going to have death. Remember, death is separation. I'm not going to have death in our marriage. And so he willingly took that fruit. But spiritually, they died because God had to remove them both from the garden and his presence. That's where God was, was in that garden. From that point on, we have been removed from the presence of God. The tabernacle was a place that God could dwell with His people. But only one person, only one person could go into the presence of God one time a year. And that was the high priest on the Day of Atonement. He could only go in the, into that place one time. Now the priest stood out there and did all the work. But the high priest was the only one that could go in there into the presence of God. Enter Jesus, who became our high priest. When Jesus died on that cross, it says that the veil in the temple was rent in two. That veil separated God, the presence of God, from everybody else. And that veil was rent in two, or torn in two from the top to the bottom, speaking that we have access to God now. See, we were reconciled back to God through the death of Jesus Christ. His death. Now then, Jesus dying on that cross was good, but it wasn't very good. Why? Because there was no life in it. Remember, like kind can only produce like kind. But his resurrection was very good. Why? Because in the resurrection, there is life, and it produces life for us. You can have a bad marriage. There may be. We discussed, it was yesterday, yeah, we had a uh, sea chop staff meeting, one of the things we discussed was unity, it was brought up, 
I don't think we realize just how important unity is. Unity between me and the Lord, me and my wife, me and this body, and the church as a body around the world. Because, see, if there's anything that gets out of unity, out of whack, I'm going to use me and, and me and Peg, Peg and I. <laughs> Sorry, Mary. Thank you. <laughs> Peg and I have been married 40 years. That wouldn't have happened if there wasn't unity between us. Now, when I'm talking about unity, I'm not saying, well, we need to paint the wall green. No, we need to paint it blue. No, it needs to be green. No, it needs to be blue. See, they're not in unity. No, we agree the wall needs to be painted. We're just going to discuss, and I'm going to pick. <laughs> okay, we're going to talk about that later. You see what I'm talking about? Unity is the foundation of every relationship. That's pretty good. Let me say that again on this side. <laughs> Unity is the foundation of every relationship. Unity <laughs> is the foundation. Thank you. Because without unity, nothing gets done. Nothing gets done. There's no life in it. There is separation. Remember what death, we always get this idea that death, I'll fall over dead, blop. And that's the, only, that's the only idea of death we've got. Death is separation. That's, what, that's the one word, one biblical word that describes death is separation. Separation from God, separation from your calling, separation from your wife. It's called divorce, and it's death to a marriage. And we can have death in our church. If we're not in unity. That doesn't mean we're going to agree on everything. It's not about coming into agreement. That's uniformity. That's cookie cutter. Everyone does the same thing. Everyone looks the same way. That's not what we're talking about. See, this is why I didn't have a PowerPoint. I'm, I'm, I'm all over this. The, the church has lost, for the most part, our focus of what we are to be doing. Now, I could ask 100 people in here what we are to do. And some are going to say, well, we need to go save souls. Well, we need to go make disciples. Well, we need to go do mission work. We need to go uh, uh, feed the hungry. We need to go uh, house the the homeless, we need, and, and all these things. And that's all good. But it's not very good. Because, see, it, the thing is, if my relationship with God is faulting, then there's no way that I can go out here and reproduce life for somebody else. I want you to listen to this next part closely. Did you hear it? <laughs> we can come in here and we can dress the part, we can walk the walk, we can talk the talk. We've got statistics, we've got figures, we've got flags, we've got this, we've got that, we've got carpeting, and we've got lighting, and we look at the musical instruments we've got, we've got it going on. If we ain't got Jesus, we ain't got nothing. I'm going to use ain't. We ain't got nothing. There's only one group of people Jesus really had a fit with, and it was the religious people. The high priests, the Sadducees, would come around wearing all their fancy robes, make long-winded prayers, had all the power of the temple. They were the boss, and they told you what to do and when to do it. 
They give tithes and made sure you saw it. They did it all like that. What did Jesus say? You hypocrites. You brood of vipers. You whitewashed tombstones. You look good on the outside, but on the inside, you're nothing but dead men's bones. That means there's death there. We're separated from the truth and the love of God. People, we're priests. We are to minister to God, and by ministering to God and me being in His presence, being in the presence of God gives me life. That unity between the two of us fills me up, turns me on, makes me go that I can reproduce that life by coming in contact and ministering to somebody else. That's what we are. We're priests. Well, Richard, what about them animal sacrifices? Well, that's a good question. You have to have a temple. We ain't got a temple. Besides that, we're not of the Levitical priesthood. We're of the Melchizedek priesthood, which makes us kings and priests. We don't do animal sacrifices. Our sacrifice is our life to God. That's why Romans 12, 1 and 2 says that. that. We are to offer our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service. We're priests. Jesus was that second Adam. He was our high priest. When he died on that cross, opened the veil of the temple, gave us access to God himself, which they did not have access before. When we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we come under his flag, under his banner, under his blood that fulfilled all the law, filled us with His Spirit. The presence of God is on the inside of me. It's my job to bring that presence of God out to this world. See, it's not about this four walls. This is where we learn. This is where we train. This is where we get built up, edified, turned on, set on fire, and sent out the door to minister out there. That's where it is, because we're priests. We're priests. And priests have certain jobs they have to do. Now, you can, you can go back and you can look at a, a Bihu and a, a Benadad and a, Bi, a, Bi, a Bihu, the sons of Aaron. They were priests. Every morning they got put on their priestly sandals. They put on their priestly garments. They looked very priestly. They walked down to the temple, to the tabernacle, and they did their priestly functions, and they had sex with women at the door, and they stole meat from the offering. And the Bible says they offered strange fire unto God, and fire shot down and killed both of them. They were priests. Didn't save them. They were the sons of Aaron. Their uncle was Moses. Didn't save them. My point is this, we can look as priestly as we want, we can look good, we can talk good, we can do flips across the floor good, oh I can worship better than anybody, I look good, but I may be full of dead men's bones, I may be full of dead men's bones. And because we get into this state of, see, Paul says in, in Romans, I die daily. Does that mean he falls over dead daily? No. 
He dies to himself daily. He dies to his, what he wants, and exchanges it for what God wants. He dies to his agenda so that he can take on God's agenda. Because, see, there, there, there is a way. Proverbs says, there is a way that seems right unto men, but that way is death. In fact, it says it in two places, chapter 14 and chapter 16. It says it twice, the exact same way. Hmm. I wonder if he's trying to tell us something. Well, anyway. There is a way that seems right unto man. And my point is this. We can't do it our way. We've done it our way for years. How's that working for us? You know, in America, we have the highest crime rate in murder, abortion, the highest crime rate in suicides, uh, and overall, just all of them put together, we have the highest crime rate. How's that working for us? People, you're called to a purpose. You're called to a purpose. Every single person in here has a purpose and a destiny for God. We sang that song a while ago. Something about, I wrote it down. Let me look. I can't remember. Well, we sang a lot of songs. We, you make me come alive about life. My heart is coming alive. Coming alive. Because we're in the presence of God. Without the presence of God, there is no life. You think you're alive. Oh, I'm doing fine. Anyway, I can go another way with that, and I'm not going to. I have, surren I have surrendered to your design. You know you're designed to do a certain job a certain way. All the priests had certain jobs. Not all the priests got to go into the holy place. And not all, and only one got to go into the Holy of Holies. They all had jobs, and they all did their jobs. And in that tabernacle, there was not one chair because they never sat down. And they did a 12-hour shift. They did their job, and they did it his way, not our way, not man's way. You know, you, you, you look back and you, you see some of the things that have happened in, in Scripture. He tells Moses, go take a stick and hit the rock. Everyone's thirsty. The animals are thirsty. Everyone's thirsty. Millions of people are thirsty. And he says, okay, Moses, take your staff and hit the rock. What? Hit a rock? Does that make sense? You see, that's God's way. What would we say? Well, well, that doesn't, that's silly. Let's get a shovel and start digging here and let's find a well. We could have dug the sand out of the desert. I guarantee you God's going to make sure there's no water there. But when you take that stick and you walk over there and you do what he said, and you smack the dumb rock, water flows when you do it his way, not our way. There's ways that seem right to us. See, this is why, this is why we pray. Let me ask you this, another survey. Don't raise your hand. How many of you pray and ask God before you make a decision on anything, on everything, put it that way? Well, I'm getting ready to buy a house, and I'll talk to 300 people about that house and doing this, that, and the other, and loans and everything else, and then I might pray about that. But if I'm going to go out and shop at Walmart, I don't need to pray about that. But you know, God's got something for you to do out there. And we miss opportunities because we're doing it our way, not his way. And by not being in unity, we separate ourselves from the will and the purpose and the best abundant life that God has for you. Jesus said, I've came that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. Abundant life is what he wants you to have. But there's a way to do it. It's his way, not your way. So what do we need to do? Well, for one thing, we need to get in this just a little more. 
Another thing, we need to fall on our knees and seek God every single day. And like Paul said, I die daily to my wants, my agenda, my ways, so I can do what he wants, his way, because it will work. And it always brings blessing and joy and peace. His way never hurts. His way has no, has no sorrow to it. But I can guarantee you, my way does. Just ask me. I, I can tell you all about that. I've done it my way for years. Stupid. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth on me shall never die, because the last enemy to be destroyed is death. We saw that in Revelation. Don't get confused about life and alive. The book of Revelation says that the false prophet gives life to the statue, that image that everyone's supposed to worship. That word life is a spirit in the Greek. Not talking about life, it's talking about a spirit that he puts in that statue. Satan cannot give you life. He can only steal, kill, and destroy. And that's what he wants to do with you. But Jesus said, I want you to have life. I want you to have abundant life. You've already got eternal life. He wants you to have abundant life now. He said, but you need to die daily. Your way ain't going to work. You've already tried it. It don't work. You know that. I know that. He wants you to take on his likeness, his power, his image, his love, his compassion, And even when all hell is breaking loose in this world, if you are in the presence of God and in His doing His purpose and His plan in His presence, you can be happy, joyful, no matter what is going on around you. Your circumstances do not dictate you. Jesus dictates that if you're in Jesus, if you do it his way, if you do, if we're the only one with choice. Trees ain't got a choice. Flowers don't have a choice. We do. He said, I've placed before you blessings and cursings, life and death. Choose ye this day. I want us to choose life. I want this church to choose life. I want you as an individual to choose life. I want your marriage to be heaven on earth, full of life. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Let's stand. I still got about 30 pages of notes. Anyone want to hang around? Take the hand of the person next to you, if you can. I want you to pray for them. I want you to pray for this church, that we will come into the perfect will of God, that we will do it His way. We will seek His way, not our way, that we will fulfill our purpose in Jesus' name, Father, I thank you for this day, Lord. Father, I just thank you for every person that's in here, Lord God. I speak a blessing upon them. Lord, I just ask for a change of our hearts, a change of our mind. Let us see what this death and life thing is all about. 
that we can have life and have it more abundantly. You've given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. You've already given it to us. Let us walk it out, Lord. Let us do, be what you have called us to be. Let us do what you called us to do. Let us fulfill that 